Good afternoon. We're going to get ready to start the, uh, the panel this afternoon. I'm Phyllis Dennery. I'm a professor in molecular biology, cell biology, and biochemistry. Uh, I will introduce our moderators first. Uh, we have Miles Mundy, a graduate student uh, here at Brown, and Carolina Meja Pena, a, post, uh, a postdoc fellow who did her PhD here at Brown, and she's here at Brown. So on the panel, we have Pam Rios Coronado, raise, wave your hand, from Stanford University. She's a graduate student uh, in uh, Dr. Red Horse's lab. Uh, we have, uh, who's next? China Gray, grad student. You just heard her wonderful talk at Brown. Uh, then John Hernandez, a PhD postdoctoral fellow here who did his PhD at, at UMass. And uh, lastly, uh, Soraya McKeithen Mead, if I messed it up, sorry, uh, who did her PhD at MIT and is now a postdoc there, but on her way to Stanford University. So uh, take it away. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Can everyone hear me all right? Okay, great. Um, so the title of the panel is Pandemic Perspectives on Research Training, What to Keep and What to Retire. Uh, the COVID pandemic impacted every aspect of our day-to-day -day lives, including the way we carry out our responsibilities in the lab. If you conduct wet lab research, certainly your day-to-day -day was upended. But even if you were in a dry lab, the way in which we engaged with our colleagues, advisors, and mentees was affected, and not just in terms of logistics. Um, so with that in mind, we developed this panel and discussion questions to reflect on how we learned to adapt our scientific and interpersonal communication methods how we developed accountability and compassion for our coworkers and ourselves during a period of uncertainty and chronic stress, and the habits and skills um, that we developed over the course of COVID that translate or don't to our current working environment. Um, so for the next hour or so, we'll go through some of the prepared questions um, with the panel, and towards the end, we'll open up the floor for questions from the audience. Uh, so with that, I'll let Miles go on. Thanks, Carolina. Can everyone hear me okay? So the first question I wanted to start out with everyone was, how did communication with your mentor and your colleagues change during this time period? We know it's very sensitive with COVID. It's very hard. You have to email people back and forth. There's Zoom meetings. How do you feel like those communication styles changed during the pandemic? Um, I guess I can start. Um, I'm in Dr. Al Ayala's lab. He's here in the audience. So. Um, before the pandemic, uh, he has a very open door policy in his office, so I was able to just knock, knock and ask my question or ask if he had a minute. Um, now I'd say he's still very open to, to meet pretty regularly and just for like little bits and little things that I need to talk to him about, but it's all over Zoom. So I guess Zoom, Zoom, Zoom is the key for us. Um, yeah, so that's been my experience, but it's been a decent transition, I think. It's been, it's been okay. Oh, so I had a particularly hard transition in communication. So uh, my mentor happens to be our department chair. He's also immunocompromised and we're in COVID. Um, so prior to the pandemic, it was very open door policy. I did not need to set up meetings with him. I would just drop by his office like, hey, something really exciting, got a cool idea. Let's talk, let's nerd out. Um, however, once the pandemic happened and lockdown started, um, it became impossible to get in contact with him. He would be in meetings all day, um, you know, had to be pretty flexible in terms of Zoom sometimes happened. He'd text me at 9.30 p.m. Do you have time to meet at 9.45? <laughs> um, okay, uh, so that was a very hard transition. But what also started to happen is, again, he's department chair, and he's even still not really coming in because COVID numbers are up. Uh, and so we just have to be pretty flexible as a lab about that. But as like the senior member of the lab at that point, there was, you know, um, some jokes like, oh, you're running my now lab now, which is like, cool, that's great. I'm glad for this opportunity, but I'm also still a graduate student who has my own stuff that needs to get done. So we had to have a very frank conversation at some point, whereas like I've been given the go ahead to defend and leave, but this still isn't happening. So let's sit down, we're having some breakdowns in communications, I need to establish some goal lines and kind of manage up at this point. Uh, and so after this conversation, we kind of set up very weekly meetings at a scheduled time. 
uh, I went in with these are what we need to accomplish in these meetings, just because at that point, being very mindful of the both the position that both of us were in, right? He had a very increased burden. I also had an increased burden, but wanted to leave and had different um, goals and a timeline for those that he necessarily might not be aware of because of everything else going on. Um, so I took a very direct approach in things I was unhappy in, things where I think we could both work together to change our communication styles so that there was no misunderstandings. Um, and kind of, these are what I need for myself to get out of here and to achieve my goals, and how can I make that work within your time frame? And so using that going forward, um, when there's any type of miscommunication, I'm very much on top of it. Like I need right, some accountability from you here. Can you tell me exactly what you mean by that? What's an expected reasonable timeline uh, for these things? Um, yeah, um, I think my communication improved after the pandemic, um, mainly because my advisor, I don't see Christy that nice. Um, she stopped traveling. So before we set up meetings every two weeks or something like that, but sometimes they don't happen because she's traveling or some other reason. But after, during the pandemic, we started meeting every week, which I thought was overwhelming in the beginning, but then it helped our relationship and our, set up our goals. Uh, we also tried to stay away from Zoom and we use Slack, which was new and it's great because sometimes you don't wanna have a half an hour meeting for something that you can just do in text in a couple of minutes. Um, yeah, I think I'm, I think I'm one of the few lucky ones that the, the communication improved after. Yeah, so I work with Dr. Carla Cowan, and before the pandemic, we met once a week, we had lab meetings, all those things. During the pandemic, it just kind of switched to online, so not much of that changed. Um, but there was a lot more conversations about goal setting, like you're talking about. Um, in part because research is kind of shut down or productivity um, and several conversations in our lab just about like where everyone's at mentally because there was a lot going on in terms of social justice movements and just um, some a lot of us in the lab actually have family who was in other states and that increases kind of the mental burden I guess in doing research and prioritizing your mental health but also the work you're doing um, but I will say that it got better because we had to have those kinds of conversations. And so we were very open about, hey, I'm struggling this week. A family member's going through X, Y, and Z, or I'm not, you know, things are kind of getting to me. So there was a lot more open conversation about what's going on and then discussions about what can be done to kind of decrease our stress and maybe readjust goals and uh, things like that. So some of you already touched um, on this, but kind of just because of the circumstances, like the nature of the conversations that you were having changed a little bit. It wasn't strictly science. Um, and so I guess I'm curious um, whether the kind of quality of like your mentee or mentorship, because I'm sure like as graduate students and postdocs, we are both mentored and mentor other people. Um, whether kind of the quality of those conversations or relationship changed over the course of COVID? Heavy question, I'm sorry. I could start. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think the nature of my mentors and I conversation did um, completely change after the start of the pandemic and also with the George Floyd uh, incident. Um, so one, conversation that I'll remember that we had earlier in, in my career and then later and the dynamics that changed around that were kind of the power imbalance that occurs between mentors and their trainees. And so I remember a specific conversation we had early on where we kind of talked about this and I didn't feel that I could completely go into that conversation and how I felt about it. Um, and then kind of following everything that happened, that became a very easy conversation to have because first I could relate and kind of, you know, find, um, relate to, you know, on a human level, like humanly, what are you going through, right? In COVID with the autoimmune. And then we have this very directly intense incident that, you know, for my identity, I found completely traumatic and really was impacting my ability to show up. 
Um, and so with that, I was able to point out direct incidences within our relationships and conversations where that power dynamic was coming through that he didn't necessarily identify in that moment. Um, and so just kind of with co the context of everything happening, we were actually able to reach a point where he's like, you know, I understand now what you're saying. And he said, maybe I can improve the way that I'm listening and change the way I'm coming into these conversations, um, which has made a lot of things much easier. And so now when we have meetings, I can simply be like, we've had this conversation before. I can tell you exactly right how this has gone, the arguments we're both going to bring to this, right? Let's, we can move on to other things uh, where we can both get something out of it. Um, and so I think this has also benefited uh, the current climate in the lab is that we can have a lot more of these. Let's just acknowledge what's happening. Let's get to this point where we can all be very productive. Um, and so from that, I think it's something to like move forward with further in communication. Okay, I can go. Um, <clears throat> I feel like the approach that I have in conversations is the same. I never like to feel like I'm wasting someone's time when I'm having a conversation with them. So I really do plan out the points that I want to discuss with my PI um, or with someone who I'm collaborating with and I want to have a conversation with them. Um, but meeting over Zoom, I'm able to share like PowerPoints, stuff like that, which has been easier in some ways to get my point across when I'm trying to have a discussion. Um, this isn't really pandemic related, but I, in 2020, I also became a mother. So my conversation has changed a lot with my boss in that sense. I feel like I'm constantly frantic, like, oh my gosh, my kids are doing this thing or that thing. Um, and then the pandemic has impacted me as far as being able to come into work. And so I've had to, um, I think explain why I'm not there in some in some ways and and bring um, remote projects into the mix so that I can still be productive even though I'm not able to be um, in the lab. So that's sort of how my conversations have shifted a little bit in the past couple of years. Um, okay, so one thing I learned during the pandemic was to be understanding um, because my advisor was extremely understanding with my situation. Uh, everyone in my family was essential workers, so I couldn't necessarily, I was worried all the time about, about them and, and, and me and etc. cetera. Uh, so I learned how to be understanding with my own mentees. I had two, I had three undergrads throughout the pandemic and my way of setting expectations with them it just had to change dramatically because they're also going through a hard time and luckily for them and us, for both of for the group of us, um, they were able to do the research at home. So yeah, that was my takeaway. I just learned to be understanding of how much they could do or uh, the stress that they were going. So they it took me a lot and I cannot only imagine how much the PIs had to go through to do this with every single member. Um, yeah, that was my takeaway. Yeah, so um, I was actually pretty lucky because during my PhD, I was in an IMSD program and I was mentored directly by Dr. Sandra Peterson, who's an amazing scientist at UMass. She actually won the mentoring award from President Obama. So um, we always had a lot of really in-depth conversa conversations about balancing work life. So I feel like during the pandemic, I had a lot of really productive conversations with my mentors, but I think where that experience really paid off was that um, I was really useful in translating the undergraduates that were working under me and their experiences to my mentors because there sometimes is different perspectives with mentors and graduate students, postdocs. And so it was very useful for me to be very candid and say, well, this undergraduate might be experiencing X, Y, and Z. There may be a reason why they're not responding, you know, things like that. So just speaking more at a human level than just at a scientific level. So um, kind of in going into the topic of the pandemic, we thought it would be a good idea to touch upon boundary setting. 
So because work hours are already kind of ambiguous as graduate students, postdoctoral fellows, et cetera, how do you feel like you were able to still assert boundaries in a time where a lot of those kind of boundaries between work, life, sick days, non-sick days were kind of just all mixed together? Um, yeah, I can start. Um, I think I had to, um, again, I bring a different perspective because I um, had my first child in April of 2020. So, um, and the lab that I work in is at the hospital. And I remember reaching out to um, my PI when I was nine months pregnant in March of 2020 and being like, I really don't feel comfortable coming into lab anymore. It hasn't been shut down yet but there was like a testing site, like the scary white tent close to the entrance of the lab. So I was like freaking out and panicked. And I was like, I would rather work from home. So again, I had to sort of work with him on um, goals that I could attain from home, uh, working on a paper, that sort of thing. Um, and that was the start of setting boundaries about safety and how I felt um, it would be better for me to be at home. Uh, and that's been maintained um, throughout the past couple of years. And I'm lucky he has been very um, open and um, respectful of the boundaries that I've feel, I feel that I've had to set. Uh, yeah, so um, boundary setting for me was not a huge problem. I'm a non-traditional student, so I had worked for a while uh, in different industries. Like I've done QC as a microbiologist for a food company. I've worked in hospitals. I've worked on cars. Um, so for me, I came in very much with a mindset of this is what I do while at MIT, right? In terms of classwork, this is what I do in the lab. You know, I do my hours. I get what I want to get done done. I'm here to mentor students, but I have hard boundaries in terms of times to contact me and when I'm necessarily available. So for me, it was kind of a relief that I went from being a unicorn to a lot of other people setting boundaries and it becoming much more normalized. Um, another thing that was kind of uh, nice was MIT completely shut down all operations for two months and then we very slowly ramped up uh, the research enterprise as they call it. Uh, and so what that meant is we had set hours per lab that we could use and so um, I liked it from the standpoint of I, I think a lot of times when you're kind of in the middle of your PhD, you kind of get into this, oh, I need to be super productive and get all these things done. And this kind of allowed everybody to take a step back, decide what experiments you're going to prioritize, and then, you know, submit for the hours you would work based on the needs in the lab and how many hours we had as a lab per square footage, et cetera. Um, so I thought that it was actually very nice way for people to kind of establish their boundaries, set up priorities, and kind of, you know, do better science under such extreme circumstances. Yeah. yeah, so boundary setting for me was in the context of goals that I was trying to achieve. So one of the things I started developing, like, you have to read, right, to advance science. You have to analyze data. So as long as I can be productive between nine to five and not on weekends, perhaps there's not necessarily a need for us to be communicating at 9 p.m. kind of thing. Um, and then also like in order to document that, I made Excel spreadsheets where I'd like read papers and I'd write like the journal it came from, the year, the research group, and I'd write some of the key findings. And so that was a way of both documenting what I've been reading so that I can reflect on it later, but also demonstrating to my advisors hey, here's what I've been reading. Maybe they can throw some papers in there and give me some suggestions. So I felt like that was a very you know, safe way of uh, demonstrating that with boundaries, I can still be productive and also an active contributor to the lab. I feel like I don't want to answer the question because, <laughs> because I don't think I have boundaries. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll give, okay, I'll justify why. <laughs> to me, it's very relaxing to do experiments and to be in the lab environment because I had I was worried about so many other things in, with my family. So I found it relaxing. Prior to, like a week prior to shutdown, I just felt like something was wrong. And I asked my advisor, can I take the computer, the lab computer home? I live on campus, so it wasn't that bad. 
<laughs> that's why I didn't want to answer that question. Uh, so I just allowed me to have work at home and my mile boundary was that I pick whenever I wanted to do that work. So I don't like setting up nine to five. I, I, I hate structure like that. So whenever I felt like I needed to do the work, I would do it work and just send updates. And that helped me. I'm sorry about my non-boundary story. <laughs> Um, I don't know, I guess I'm, I'm hearing that like implicit and like being able to like effectively set boundaries, like there is a level of trust that you have to have with whoever, whoever you're setting boundaries with because they have to trust that you're going to hold yourself accountable. Um, yeah, no, super important. Um, and I guess a, like a, a follow up and, um, you guys have already touched on it a little, um, just because we were all now suddenly under like the same circumstances. Um, was it easier or harder to set boundaries during COVID? And now that things, COVID's not over, but <laughs> now that um, some of the restrictions have, have lifted, have you found yourself having to like reset those boundaries? <laughs> um, and if so, like how do you justify or how do you navigate those conversations? Um. I don't want to brag, but I feel like my relationship with my PI is really good, so I haven't had to reestablish boundaries now that things, restrictions have, um, you know, loosened quite a bit. Um, I get my work done when I need to, and I'm productive, and I go to lab meeting, and I have something to show, and I think that's what I need to do, and that's what I've needed to do, and it works for me, so I haven't I'm not the best, that's not the best answer for this question. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's been, um, very seamless as things, um, open back up and, yeah. Um, I think it was, it's one, it was easy to set boundaries during the pandemic. Uh, and two, I've actually found that the boundaries that I had already established are still in place, not, a problem. They've led to very productive um, interactions and framework for getting, you know, my stuff done, helping other people get their stuff done. Uh, so I'm generally pretty happy. With, yeah. Yeah, I would say they haven't changed much either. I mean, the more productive you are, there's more things to talk about, and more papers to send, and edits and drafts. So maybe sometime soon I'll have another conversation. But um, it, for the most part, it's been pretty much the same. But I think. In part, that's because me and my advisor, we communicate a lot all the time. And so there's always this understanding that if there needs to be a boundary, it will just be said. Or if there's no response, but one of the things that we do if anyone's on Slack, maybe adopt this, is if you want to acknowledge you saw something, but you're not ready to respond, just give it a thumbs up. Yes, and since we, since I said that I have no boundaries. The update was I had to give the computer back because now we all needed to use the computer. <laughs> Which made me a little sad. Um, <laughs> I, I'm not sure what... Um, well, oh, one thing I learned was to say no, um, particularly when it came to training because training during COVID um, is very challenging to train in person. So I didn't, I didn't feel comfortable for a while to train someone in person. So all my training was online. And yeah, that was that was my one boundary that I had. So um, one thing we also kind of want to talk about in terms of setting boundaries, in terms of COVID, all these things going on is how did you balance your mental health and how did you manage to be compassionate with yourself during the pandemic? I know often, uh, for me personally, it was easy to beat myself up about not being productive in certain instances. But how did you manage to be compassionate bo to both yourself and to others around you? Yeah, so first, um, being compassionate towards myself and coping with um, maybe not being as productive as I could be because of the pandemic. Um, I think I have a really great sounding board in my partner. And so I definitely vent. I'm hard on myself when I speak to him about, you know, my shortcomings or, um, areas that I can improve. And a lot of the time he'll be like, 
China, come on, you're doing great. And he'll remind me in the large, you know, grand scheme of things, I'm getting what I need to get done completed. It might feel like I'm not being as productive as I could be, but in the grand scheme of things, I'm doing well. Um, and I think I am more compassionate towards other people than I am myself in these situations. So last summer I worked, um, I co-mentored a leadership alliance student and it was a virtual, um, or remote project, which is really difficult to do. It's a, we work in a wet lab. So coming up with a project and giving him the research experience that I think is so valuable as an undergrad was difficult. And I felt like it was hard for him to get passionate about the project and it really frustrated me at first. And then I realized, uh, I can't truly understand what he's going through, but I can see how things would be difficult for him. So it's taken some reflecting on um, trying to put myself in, in his situation, even though I can't really. Um, that's kind of how I've learned to give, to be more compassionate towards other people. Um, yeah, so the way that I was um, compassionate with myself is um, one of the one of the things that I really enjoy is being physically active and I had some chronic health issues that also made me susceptible um, to um, increased risk with COVID. And so one of the things I made sure that I kept doing was even though I couldn't go to the gym anymore, um, I made sure that I could still indoor outdoor activities. And so I bought myself a kayak and I went fishing. And every day that I left lab, if I left in time before sunset, I took my kayak out in the river. I sat, you know, sometimes with a hard cider and I just let a line out and fish. And that was how like just every day, at least during good weather, I could realign myself and make sure that I was okay. In terms of like having compassion with myself in terms of scientific productivity, it's kind of maybe a little bit of an anomaly because COVID allowed me to reset and I started a whole new project during um, the pandemic. And so it was, I was really kind of content and happy to be like pushing this project along, allowing myself time and space, even if everything else seemed to be burning. <laughs> um, and so I just made sure that um, I always kind of daily, weekly with my partner, with friends, just have a recentering. I spent a lot of time, you know, if I, if I was in lab, I had coffee with the people that were made up my core central support group. Um, at home, my partner and I made sure that we'd had like appreciation walks because we live in a studio. It's the pandemic and you can't do too much. <laughs> um, and so we just made sure that we'd always at least leave our four walls, go outside, go on a walk, make sure that we were doing things that made each other happy, right? Each of us independently and together. Um, and so even in kind of mentoring, I made sure that my undergrads were at least finding something um, to center themselves on and kind of recalibrate and bring that forward. Yeah, I will second that physical exercise. I walked more during the pandemic than I've ever walked in my life. <laughs> a lot of walking. Um, but I also relied a lot on friends, you know, like Zoom became the next outside of phone calls, of course. Um, but the other thing that really, really helped me, it's a book that I would really encourage y'all to read which is called Why Zebras Don't Have Ulcers by Robert Sapolsky. He's a primatologist who is also an endocrinologist. And this book was amazing because it put into the context what stress is, right? And it starts out with talking about like zebras out there at any point, they could be killed, they could be attacked, but for some reason they don't have ulcers, right? And so what is unique about the human brain that leads to us having like anxiety and stress disorders. And so in a lot of the book, it kind of helped me reframe some of my stresses and like readjust and maybe put less uh, pressure in certain areas in life. Um, so I actually read that book with a bunch of friends and we just had a lot of really like awesome conversations about how to refocus our mind whenever we're feeling extremely stressed. So I think that helped me be a little bit more compassionate with myself. Hmm. Let me think. Um, I promise I was compassionate to myself and I, I did take care of my mental health. I have to reframe it in a way that it doesn't sound like I just overwork myself. 
Um, so my, my life didn't change much because, like I, I mentioned, my family, they're all essential workers, so my partner had to work just the regular job. So I spent a lot of time alone, home, which I never had done before. And there was a limitation to my productivity because we're a wet lab, and I could only ana- reanalyze so many times the images that I already had. So what I decided was to learn something. So I learned how to code. I signed up for a class. And as bad as I am for coding, it just made me happy to learn something and to feel like I was productive doing homework from undergrads. So I had like a first, like a freshman tutoring me how to do Python. Uh, so that was embarrassing for a while, but it was very rewarding to learn something new. And then I picked up two things that I had left since I started grad school, unfortunately. So I picked up reading again and video games. And playing video games made me connect with people that I had just stopped talking because I was just focused on, on grad school. So it kind of helped me get back to my, my old friendships. Um, yeah, so that was my mental health. I, don't, I enjoy a lot of the coding and the playing the video games. What video games? Uh, <laughs> they're the violent ones. <laughs> Bo- <laughs> Call of Duty? It's, every time I speak, it just sounds worse and worse. <laughs> Borderlands, it just had, came out, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm Call of Duty Battle Royale. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so it's, I mean, it's so interesting, like, to see how everyone, like, metabolized <laughs> all of this stress. Um, but it definitely seems like a common theme in one way or another is, like, kind of reestablishing a network of, of people that can help you, um, I don't know, can sympathize and empathize with, with what you're going through. Um, I think, uh, at least for me, uh, something else that I kind of found myself um, wrapping or trying to wrap my head around um, was how to hold myself accountable <laughs> during COVID. Um, as a grad student, we don't um, have, or, you know, depending on your experience, you don't uh, necessarily have all that much structure or like set uh, milestones, especially after you qualify. <laughs> um, but you know, were there um, specific methods that you used in order to help hold yourself accountable, um, either doing work from home or holding yourself accountable to like other people or? Yeah, so again, um, making sure I had something for lab meeting. When I did take my initial um, hiatus to like the remote work world, I made sure that I was at least documenting what I was doing to work on my paper. So I would put together, you know, what I need to get done for my paper in a a PowerPoint presentation and put little stars that were either filled in or just had the outline. And when we did have lab meeting, I was like, hey, I got this section of my paper done. And it felt like I was holding myself accountable um, every couple of weeks when we would meet. And that's that was very useful for me because otherwise, yeah, it is very unstructured. (laughs) Yeah, so the, the way that I had to hold my whole self accountable is that actually I'm a bit of a workaholic, so when stressed, I naturally will work more and I will bring this home. Uh, so the, the way that I actually had to be account- accountable was that I was actually allowing time for my relationship um, and my relationship with other people and that it wasn't completely dominated by I'm stressed out, so I'm working more and I'm bringing this into everything. Um, so I just ways that I did that was to check in, kind of self-regulate, recognize if I was spiraling into complete, I've uh, deep dived into whatever I'm looking at at the moment. And so I think we we were mostly talking about in the context of how we're holding ourselves accountable to goals we've set in lab, but I think it's also important that we kind of are holding ourselves accountable to the relationships that we have, because I think we can often kind of be very focused and what we're trying to accomplish career-wise and in the lab. So my advisor and I created this Word document that was just kind of a living document and it had the week and it had the goals. So if you finished it, you could highlight it green. If you didn't, it could be yellow. And then you just copy and paste it to the next week. And it's yellow because it's not end of the world if you don't finish it, but you know, if you said you were going to do something, you should do it. Um, but very similar to you, I'm, I'm kind of a workaholic. When I get stressed, I just throw myself in work. It's reading or data analysis or even 
yeah, grant writing or thinking about grant writing. Um, but the accountability part was having that living document that I could always reflect on. And even if I had a bad week, I could look back at the other weeks and say, there's a lot of green there. That's awesome. <laughs> so, that's what I did. Yeah, I had something similar with Slack, but my own uh, way to look at things is I would set up a goal right before a camping trip. Because then I would feel so bad that I didn't finish, that I had to finish, and then I would relax on my camping trip. So I had a lot of camping trips during the pandemic. And um, when I worked with my undergrads, for me, it was not only important to set up um, timelines of when they, would be, they needed to get me something, but also it was important for me to tell them when to stop. Stop analyzing and just focus on writing either your thesis, uh, their own thesis, or their summer presentation. So I was more uh, strict when they need to stop and just focus on the presentation rather than when they need to give me data. I just told them, if you give me one point of data, like one heart, I'm fine. But just you need to stop at that time because it's important for you to understand how to ask a scientific question more than you give me the data. So I was more strict with them than I was with myself. Story of a mentor. <laughs> So I think I want to add one thing on kind of an accountability thing. So I got super into this kind of project management software that is free to academics uh, called Freedcamp. Uh, and I actually kind of used that to set out uh, what the project I was working on, what were individual steps I needed for the project. And it, you know, it allows you to say, is this in progress? Is it completed? And then if you're working with, like I had three undergrads, I could set up individual projects for them, have them have the ability to edit it, and if they wanted to use it, if it didn't feel like too much, then it just allowed us to kind of keep a record of where the project was and what milestones we wanted to hit by a certain time. So if anybody's interested, Freed Camp. So I know you all kind of talked about the support systems you utilized during COVID, whether that be your partners or your friends or like outlets of uh, frustration, <laughs> like video games and other things. But are there any things that you feel that you will carry forward with you following this weird period of the pandemic, even though it's not over? And are there things that you will leave behind because you found them maladaptive to navigating the world? Oh, that's hard to <laughs> answer. <laughs> um, yeah, I definitely started um, making more of an effort to maintain friendships uh, in the past couple of years. Um, either the D and D group that I um, participate in and have been um, in campaigns with for the past four years, um, I've tried to make more time for those individuals. Um, I think I can, in previous years, I've been a little, not antisocial, but it's easy for me to be introverted and just say, oh, I'm going to be by myself or with my partner and read a book or watch TV. But um, something that I have made more of an effort with is I don't really want to go to the park and do this thing, but I'm going to do it anyway because it's important to maintain those friendships and that support system. So I'm definitely keeping that. Um, even as we move away from the pandemic, hopefully. Um, maladaptive behavior. Maybe I'll come back to that one. <laughs> it's hard to start out. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think I'm going to keep most things that change it in terms of like communication styles going forward with mentors being very direct and confident in what I want and kind of setting you know, expectations together and working on those. Um, I'd also hope that we keep some sort of hybrid stuff because I thought it was great when I had a hybrid defense. My uh, outside committee member was in France and I kind of got to nerd out for somebody who couldn't make it in person, but he kind of found it or found the elements that I work with. So uh, I hope that we keep some sort of hybrid um, interactions going forward for, you know, if it and it looks like this will probably be endemic of COVID, so at least those that are unable to make it or unable to um, comfortably come to in-person events can interact in some form, and we can have you know better access uh, to events and stuff like that. Yeah, I guess I'd argue I'd keep most of it. 
I think one of my favorite things I developed with a close friend and then I just use it for everyone is like once every three days, I'll just send like a funny GIF or a meme to just random friends and just be like, I hope your day is going well. And just the number of people that have reached back out and been like, I really needed that. And like, oh, wow, I probably needed that, too. And they started doing that to me. I just feel like it lets people know that you're there if you need anything, but also like that you're thinking of them and they're thinking of you. I think that's probably one I'll keep the most. I feel like can feel isolating sometimes. So just reaching out to people. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with John and China. Like I try to keep my the, the connections, especially with friends that are not on my cohort. Um, I did my I'm doing my PhD in the same place that I grew up and all my friends are in the Bay Area. So, But I stopped seeing them because I was just too focused on school. Uh, so I'm trying to see them at least once a month uh, just to keep those relationships. And then a bad habit that I got rid of on the pandemic and I um, like to keep it that way is before I would come home from work and keep working. There was like no stop in my head of I need to stop thinking about science. So now I just take two hours of not thinking about science, just put away my laptop somewhere and just spend quality time with my partner. So that's one thing that I, I want to keep doing. A bad habit, I would say, I'm a little tired of Zoom. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's good and bad. It's great when you, like, you don't want to walk to see like uh, a conference or, or, or a seminar, right? You don't want to spend that time or sometimes lab meeting. But sometimes it's just too exhausting to Zoom. I just want to go and talk to the person. So I'm, I'm halfway in that one. I have to add to that. I, a habit that I do want to break is doing the, for hybrid events, doing the Zoom version instead of going in person. Cause I feel like it is a lot more rewarding when it's in person. I pay attention more. It's, it's just better all around. I mean, don't get me wrong, it was for all the fanfare of being in person, <laughs> but also very appreciative to have like, the hybrid component. That was, it was a little awkward. See, it, when I defend, I want it to be in person. Yeah. Well, the, the caveat is that you don't get free food if you do Zoom. What? Yeah. Right. I don't know. Like, I was yeah. in person, yeah. but yeah. I had a Zoom set up um, so people could participate remotely. So my, and it was in person. people probably came because... Yeah, so more, a lot more people yeah. were able to come. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, not all Zoom. Yeah, I'm over it, too. <laughs> I will say it is surprising how often food came up when we were talking about Zoom events um, and how important that is <laughs> for recruiting people. Um, but thank you so much for all of your thoughtful answers to our tricky questions. <laughs> um, but we'll open the floor now for uh, questions from anyone in the audience. <laughs> Hello, my name is Kimmy and I'm a rising third year PhD student and I'm curious for, um, I guess, getting prepared for your next step after the PhD. How does that look like as you know, we, we've missed out on a lot of the networking and the conference and the in-person and the interactions. Like, how do you make up for that? And what advice would you give for putting your best foot forward, um, kind of moving past some of like the more restricted COVID um, academic settings for networking? Yeah. Um, so I was in the position where I was ending, you know, I was hitting my stride uh, in my PhD when the lockdown occurred. So I completely missed out on conferences and everything. I was planning to start, you know, my tour of conferences that summer. Um, so it actually made my decision to stay in academia a little bit harder um, because I wasn't 100% sure what I wanted to do next. The appeal of industry and the pay was very, um, you know, it was very high priority. Um, however, I participated uh, virtually in uh, the Nibri conference last year. And so that was like a nice start to the networking. Um, and then I also was kind of involved in some other virtual events that kind of allowed me to be exposed and get some networking out there. 
And so I actually didn't decide to really apply for a postdoc until this March, right before I defended. Um, and so kind of how I went into that was I knew that there was a research area that I wanted to be in. I kind of identified who was doing research in that area. I reached out to different people and kind of did some you know, background networking, like, hey, I'm interested. What's you know, your take on this? Um, and then, you know, I finally, after sitting on it for a little bit and deciding it was what I wanted to do, where I wanted to be, and just seeing if it was a match, I reached out, arranged interviews, went out and interviewed. It happened to be a good match. Not saying that that will always be the case, but it happened to be, you know, we talked about what I wanted to do, what I'd be able to do, how they could help me in my professional development, and all the those. And after I kind of decided that it was checked off where I want it to be research-wise, it checked off what I want it to gain out of a post, you know, uh, acquire out of a postdoc position, and then I decided to ultimately commit. Um, so I, I don't know if other people have other perspectives. Um, yeah, so I feel like early on in grad school, I would go to the networking events at conferences in a more relaxed way. I was just going to maybe meet people, um, but I didn't take it... Uh, I didn't take advantage of the opportunity as much as maybe I should have, because then there's this two year gap in my conference attendance. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm entering my sixth year and I do need to figure out where I'm going to do a postdoc. Um, so I have, I'm going to be going to a conference in the fall and I'm going to be working those networking like opportunities. Um, so that's sort of my, my plan of action. So I'm already a postdoc, so I can't speak to that. But um, one thing that was really useful during the pandemic was there's a Slack channel called Future PI Slack. And there's actually a bunch of sub like discussion boards in there, some for grad students, some for postdocs. And they had these really awesome moments during the pandemic where people would just like give a brief like like uh, paragraph about themselves and maybe put their CV. And they got like really, really awesome feedback from potential like postdoctoral advisors or even people that knew about online, you know, conferences or things like that. So Slack channels like that might be very useful and they're still going pretty well now even. So that might be a good way of just getting into a community and, you know, getting your name out there. Yeah, networking was, was definitely hard. Um, yeah, the pandemic hit me right in the middle of my PhD. And it, it was it's tough to do virtual conferences and network. So what I decided to do was to focus on making figures, um, just to be ready for publication. And in my mind, I was like, if I get a paper out, it would my, might be easier to get a postdoc later. Because right now, I am, I just, not the best at networking, so it just would be worse if I do it virtually. Uh, it worked out on my advantage. Um, the data that I showed yesterday was, was already out in second review. Um, so that was my plan of attack. Just make as many figures as I can, and, and then I'll figure out where that goes and what paper. So I want to thank all of you for sharing your pandemic perspectives and for giving us so many great ideas for organizing things. I think you guys have all done a great job on using the information you learned during the pandemic to make a positive pivot. And I'm just wondering, what do you think the faculty should do? How should we reflect on this period and make positive changes in the way we look at the student-faculty interaction? Your PI isn't here. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I have I have some thoughts on that. Um, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I guess with right the pandemic and everything, it brought a lot of things to light, and it allowed kind of for this not almost almost safe space to kind of talk about these things. Um, and so I think just like bringing that forward with the like new enlightenment into social injustices and things like that, just like bringing that kind of forward into conversations. Um, so I know that for my mentor and I, we had had a lot of these conversations and at some point I shut down because the responses that I was hearing just were kind of whittling away at my, you know, my trust and perception of him. 
Um, and so I think kind of in the setting of the pandemic, we were allowed to have like more real conversations and I could directly point out within our own interactions how those were you know, impacting either our ability to communicate, my ability to really trust that he had my best interest in mind. Um, and so I hope, and I, I think based on our conversations and how things have been going forward, he's really brought this forward in our relationship. And so when we check in, it very much is kind of, you know, trainee centered. Like I ask him, what is a reasonable expectation for my publications? How many will I be getting out? How do you think you have the bandwidth to actually do this? How can I help you get there, right, as the training mentor? Like, how do we work towards this together? And so I think keeping in mind kind of with mentor trainees that it is kind of a mutually beneficial relationship in some aspects. Like, the trainees are driving a lot of work in the lab, and them being happy and feeling like they're going to meet their goals will ultimately make for a more productive um, lab. And so I think it's kind of important that there be some medium where those conversations can happen. And they're not really being accomplished in like individual development plans or stuff like that. I don't know what the mechanism will be to do that, but I think it is better for the trainees. And especially, right, this is kind of like a DEI conference. And if you want to decrease attrition rates and have better retention, I think it's especially important to have that with, you know, trade needs from underrepresented, underserved identities. I do have like objective advice, I guess, to offer. Um, I think it's important, especially the pandemic has shown us how deeply um, sensitive or how important mental health is as for productivity. And I think it's important to be open to those conversations and asking your students, how are you doing? Maybe their productivity isn't great because they are dealing with some depression, anxiety, that stuff really does take a toll. So I think um, moving forward when we aren't, when we don't have this crisis, there are other things that impact that as well. So in our lab, one of the things that we started doing was reading books that were like DEI centered. And as a lab, we would have conversations about them, which sometimes they were quite hard conversations, but they're really important conversations where I feel like people from very different backgrounds can have talk about real truths. And so some I feel like some way of incorporating that or maybe lifting that up as like a very positive things if labs choose to do that would be super helpful because I feel that they're you know, I'll speak to my experience. I remember during my PhD, my advisor would be like, oh, you have to be here during the weekend, stay till 10 p.m. That's because that was their experience. And so there needs to be some kind of communication where it's, it's you know, we appreciate what you did, but maybe that's not necessary, you know, in this day and age, or even for me as an individual. And so unless you have that communication, or at least that communication is being respected and kind of looked at in a different way, maybe even at the department level, or talked about like at faculty meetings, like these are the kinds of things that allow this like across generation uh, growing to occur. So some way of uplifting those kinds of initiatives and efforts, I think are some of the best things, at least from my experience that I think can happen. <laughs> yeah, um, I would like to add that, um, PIs, um, or what we, uh, our lab went through the pandemic was that often our PIs, our mentors, communicate their needs to us. I need you to give me this data. I need you to do this. Uh, but it's very few occasions that we, the trainees, get to communicate our needs. Like, I need you to support me in this and that and that. And because the pandemic just slowed down everything and allowed for these spaces uh, to be filled particularly in lab meeting because there's no data to be shared. Like, let's just talk about how can we improve the lab? What is that we need from you? What is it, it's your outlook um, for the next five years? How you see the, pro the, the projects in the lab going? And these are questions that the trainees were asking, Chris in this case, and I would love for that to keep going in not on, only in our lab, but in other labs.
All right. Thank you, everybody, for sharing, um, you know, this, per these personal stories from during the pandemic. Um, it sounds like you each had um, some mechanisms that you use to get through the pandemic, but also that are um, kind of you're going to you're going to carry with you to ensure that you're going to continue to be successful. And so I'm just wondering if, you know, knowing that there are these things that you need to be successful, how has that affected your thoughts on what job you want to do next, what kind of questions you're asked, what you're looking for from a future employer? So putting on my director of postdoc affairs hat here, you know, when, if you're looking for a postdoc, are you looking, are you going to be asking particular questions, looking for certain resources or, um, you know, I don't know, looking for certain type of institutional culture um, that will enable you to continue with these um, mechanisms that have helped you or in your um, your search for a postdoc, kind of what attracted you, attracted you to that position? Um, and do you think that these are gonna be things that you can carry forward with your next job? Sure, I could start. Yeah, after recently having found <laughs> my next employment. Um, I 100% took my experience from grad school and the conversations with my mentor into my decision um, to stay in academia and pursue a postdoc at Stanford. Uh, so one of the things that I was looking for, so I actually, I visited the Kansom, camp, campus through the PRISM initiative. However, I did not directly apply for it. Uh, and so what happened was I emailed the professors that I was interested in working with. Um, I directly asked them their thoughts on DEI um, and kind of their involvement in it, what they felt the climate was like. Um, and one thing that I was especially looking for was the community involvement in it without it being the burden of those most interested and how they felt that that was being accomplished. Um, and so kind of as that, they directly were like, hey, I think you should come in with that. I was like, okay. And I also, while I was there, I asked all the lab members, most of the people I interacted with, how do you think the university's doing? How do you think the lab's doing? What initiatives are in place? Um, and kind of, for me personally, I'd made the decision, like I'd love to stay in academia, but if, it's not necessarily serving me in the ways I want, or I don't feel like I'm going to be able to keep the integrity of my mental health and well-being and my identity that I'm fine with going elsewhere. Um, and so I looked for, so Stanford has the initiative of they, their base salary is 68. Granted, the areas do very expensive, but it's a lot higher than the national average. I don't know how they're accomplishing that, but they make it kind of a standard. Um, I kind of, asked in terms of what the benefits were available. Um, and so I just, I also asked the labs that I was applying to what their publication policies were, how they felt about time in lab, what the culture was of the lab, what the expectations were, what kind of professional development they offered their trainees or encouraged. Um, and so I was just very direct in asking all of those and making sure that I felt best served in that position. Yes, yeah, so I just recently um, determined that I want to be in an academic, traditional academic track and pursue an academic postdoc. Um, I wasn't sure for a long time, um, but part of that is because I have had some wins in my research and so it's like, oh, this it can work. All of these experiments can actually work and be fruitful. Um, but also the work-life balance that I've been able to attain in graduate school. I hope to find that in a postdoc as well. So that is one thing that I will definitely, you know, inquire when I do apply. What are your policies as far as nine to five, Monday through Friday? Do you expect weekends? Do you expect long hours? Um, those are important things for me that I'm going to be looking for as I transition to a postdoc. Um, because I do have a family and that is important. It's an important consideration for me, but also the ability to be independent and flourish and pursue scientific questions that are of interest. So I can't speak to what I look for in a postdoc, because I'm already in it, but I will say um, recently with everything that's been going on, I'm kind of split between going the academic route or applying for a AAAS fellowship which for anyone who doesn't know, that's a transition from academia to like policymaking. 
specifically for like substance use disorders for me. So I think one of the things that's been the most meaningful to me is that the community here at Brown or even at Kearney uh, being welcoming of that approach um, for some people who didn't actually know what it involved, like them asking and looking into it for me and helping me develop a network. Um, and hopefully that can be something that stays here at Brown is that, you know, going to that from postdoc or postdoc to faculty or grad student to postdoc is just as like, you know, amazing as going from academia into like policymaking. Cause I'm sure I, I have many friends who are very interested in shaping uh, changes in the United States at the local state or, you know, federal level. So I think that that's really important to think about um, or to have that support, I guess. Um, um, I'm looking for the money. Like I said, every time I say something, it just comes out worse. Uh, so I've been, I'm very fortunate to be in a lab that is well-funded. Uh, we recently got HHMI. And having that freedom to be creative with your science, it, it's, it's just the best feeling. So um, for, I, want, I want to be a PI later on. So I'm going to go to a postdoc, and I want to be in a lab that not only has the sufficient funds, but it's also in a place that has re resources that I can utilize, but that my advisor trusts me to spend that money. Um, uh, because I feel like it, uh, the best asset of a scientist is to be creative with the science. And if that's, if money's a restriction, then it puts a restriction on your creativity and on your science. So that's what I'm looking at in a postdoc. Yeah, like I said, I don't have much boundaries, so I'm not that worried about the times. And that you can take the computer home. Right. <laughs> So we're actually right on time to end the panel uh, discussion, but I just want to take the time to thank you guys. You gave fantastic answers to all of our questions, so please join me in thanking them. <laughs>